You're watching ADX Live HD powered by Jetline Systems. So glad all of you could join us this morning. I am DeAndre Newman from AirDailyX.net and joining me this, should I say morning, afternoon, evening, it's Saturday in some places, uh, in the cases with my two guests today, Ken Hall and Tim Harris uh, in Sydney, Australia, or Western Australia, I should say, are joining us on a Sunday morning. I believe it's just uh, 10 minutes past uh, 8 o'clock a.m. for uh, the Orbix Systems Developers. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Andre. There we go. So glad you guys could uh, be with us this morning. I have to say, I think you guys have definitely taken uh, the community off guard with your latest release, uh, Papua New Guinea. I don't think anyone uh, could have envisioned a, a, a series of airports, and of course not a series yet, but certainly with your latest release. Uh, it, it almost in and of itself is a series because there are so many airfields that are included uh, in this package along of course with uh, the Port Moresby uh, airport as well. Uh, I don't think anyone expected that something like this would come out of Orbix that is in fact uh, not a part of the uh, sort of business strategy that, uh, that is the epiphany of Orbix. Uh, so uh, I have to say, with <laughs> once that release announcement uh, came out, I think a lot of people were probably a little bit on the confused side. Uh, I think confused yet extremely excited, and that certainly speaks for myself. So uh, just, I guess, in a few words, <laughs> how did this whole thing come about, and what sort of led you in this direction? Um, I think well, both me and Ken I always loved Papua New Guinea, and um, we've always been you know, waiting for a Papua New Guinea FTX region, um, but we, we knew it wasn't going to happen in the in the short short term, so we just sort of thought we'd take the bull by the horns and just do it. Um, and so yeah, that's what we did, and we sort of kept it a surprise from everyone, um, even uh, a bit of a surprise from the team as well. And uh, we sort of we hit them with it very late in the uh, in the beta, and uh, yeah, and then just like we hit all you guys with it very very late in the piece. Um, but yeah. It was just a, a dream that we dreamt up, and uh, we, we made it. I think one of the great things about the fact that you guys waited, I think, a little later on to uh, make the announcement, especially at a stage of development where you were so close to release, is for a lot of people that follow the Air Daily X billboard, I try to project projects as far out, and in fact, I think there's projects that are that are projected as far out as 2015, so it sort of gives us a bit of an idea or something of an understanding in terms of what we can expect uh, will, will be delivered at, throughout the course of the rest of the year, and then of course probably the first quarter or two into next year, but I think the great thing is, is are these little projects from talented developers that we just don't know about, that just sort of come out of left field, and that sort of makes it like Christmas morning <laughs> throughout the year when these sort of things just, just kind of happen, and so naturally, this was a product that was not on the or Orbix roadmap, so it, it, it's, it's like the extra candy uh, that, uh, that's, that shows up on the store shelf that you weren't looking for. Uh, just just the whole thing of it's announced and then here we are a couple of weeks later and boom here it is and it's like oh my gosh it's pretty incredible and I have to imagine uh, the uh, the response from the community I, I imagine it's been good but uh, coming from your position as developers what would you say uh, has been the community feedback and response toward the project thus far? Um, um, well, Ken you want to go? Oh uh, okay um, well we're sort of blown away um, we were we were hoping it would be successful because it was a new concept. We we've done quite a few airports, and <clears throat> Tim said to me, "Let's let's do something different. Let's do something that's just more than just an airport. Let's do something where they can have an experience." And we've we've always followed the the exploits of um, the bush pilots of Papua New Guinea, and that these guys are 
are just masters. I mean, they just the, 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 they land these planes in the most awkward uh, situations, and, and for us, that's that's the ultimate of flying. Um, you know, so to be able to try something like this was just um, um, fantastic for us. And then when people saw it, we we weren't sure if they were going to um, embrace it, but we're just blown away by the way people are coming back and saying ridiculous things like, you know, um, we sort of nearly have to pull up and say, oh, come on, get let's get real, guys. This is not the best airport ever done. This is not, you know. Um, but I think it's because it's different um, and refreshing. I think that's that's what's taken them. And we're, we're, we're extremely happy, extremely happy. Well, I, I think, uh, Ken, the, the key word that, I, that you hit on the head was refreshing. And by that, number one, uh, except for maybe freeware, and I only assume that there may be freeware out there because a lot of freeware that we've seen over the years have been from developers that were just really fed up with no one taking the time to develop something in their region or maybe they visited a place before and it, it just became obvious it wasn't going to happen. And I've actually, I know developers uh, personally who have gotten into scenery development just because they wanted an airport so bad they knew it was never going to come because it's in a remote location of the world or maybe it's something that a, a, that a, a mainstream developer may not consider as popular. Uh, or would sell uh, uh, well, so they sort of just taken it upon themselves to go into freeware and, and uh, things, things of that nature. So, uh, again, to touch on refreshing, the fact that not only are we sort of on untouched territory as far as payware goes, at least as far as I'm aware of, but in such a great level of detail and quality that you guys have presented it is incredible. So my, my question is because I like to think that I'm well-rounded in terms of uh, locations around the world, and I've certainly traveled quite a bit, but I've never been to Papua New Guinea, and it's certainly a, a region of the world that's remained largely off my radar. One of the things I mentioned previously in one of my articles uh, when I was showing off some of your pre development previews was that I was watching uh, a movie that was based on a true story uh, where some cave divers were going from Australia, actually, into Papua New Guinea for cave diving. And uh, for them, unfortunately, it didn't turn out too well, but there was a particular scene where uh, they flew a helicopter out of Port Moresby and into this remote location in Papua New Guinea, and the terrain was immaculate. And I just thought to myself, wow, this is a really beautiful scenery and location. And I, I found myself kind of wondering it would be great if someone would actually go into this area and develop something for it. And mind you, this was about a month ago. Uh, so naturally, my thoughts were quickly shut down by the thought that I doubt there is a large flight simulation community in Papua New Guinea. Therefore, the chances of a developer going in there and creating something in high quality is highly unlikely. And then two months later, here we have this terrific scenery. So my question is, is how did you learn about these airports? Because I certainly didn't know. I mean, obviously, I knew about Port Moresby, but I certainly didn't know about a lot of these rural airstrips out here and, uh, and the challenging uh, approaches that take place. So how did you guys find out about it? Um, I'll let Tim well, answer that. As, I mean, as, as Australians, we've all grown up with uh, the Kokoda track ingrained into our history. Um, it, was the, it was the point for you know, where our country kind of grew up. Um, uh, when when we were um, faced with you know, possible invasion in, in World War Two, and uh, it's it's yeah it's a very special place for for a lot of us, and uh, a, a lot of us make pilgrimages there to walk the track. It's uh, 90, uh, 90 miles I think, or ninety kilometres of um, pretty inhospitable terrain, and it, it takes about um, seven or eight days I think to walk one way. Um, and that's the thing that a lot of Australians have started doing in the last four or five, four or five years. But um, yeah, so we've all we'll, we've all grown up with with the Kokoda track in the back of our heads, and uh, and of course Papua New Guinea being um, such a sort of a remote and unexplored country, the air travel is is the number one way to get around. Uh, the roads are very unreliable, and um, and I think also the locals can be a little bit hostile at times too. Um, <laughs> and so yeah, everything everything is air, air travel in Papua New Guinea. So, um, and I, I also think in in the real world too, a lot of uh, young pilots um, get their first break flying in in Papua New Guinea. Uh, and and as they say, if you can fly in in PNG, then you can probably fly anywhere. 
so so yeah so the, the, all of, all of the strips um Kokoda, or foggy um minari all those strips are all um, very close to places where there were major battles um in world war ii and so it's got a lot of, a lot of history like that well, that's certainly quite a bit of insight that uh, I don't think we got from <laughs> from the uh, the manual. I actually I had no idea. So this is something that I've learned myself as well today, just about the historical element and definitely the cultural element uh, that led the two of you uh, making the decision to develop the scenery. Now, can I assume that you've made the pilgrimage, either one of you? No, but We'd I'd love to. Love love to. Yeah. Well, I feel like. Uh, because of this it's development, I think a lot of us are going are gonna to make this pilgrimage in one way or, or other. And, and I think that's one of the great things that makes flight simulation so great is that uh, I remember when I first came on board with Air Daily X, and that there was this, this general understanding that uh, people didn't buy sceneries or airports uh, that they had not actually visited in real life. A lot of people typically tend to stick toward uh, their home airports or places they visited, and certainly that was the case when I very first got into flight simulation. Uh, I wanted to start looking for airpl airports and places that I had been in, in, in real life, but after a while, those places got boring, and I wanted to start trying new places and, and visiting uh, new, new areas. And uh, I, I think what's one of the things that has made flight simulation so great is for those who are willing to sort of go off the beaten path and, and have an open mind towards products that represent places that they've never been, they can certainly discover the world in flight simulation pretty much in the same way that they could discover the world in real life. I mean, these places absolutely exist. And when we have third party developments come on board and, and make them to their real world counterparts, it's, it's almost I don't want to say it's the same because nothing is like visiting a place in real life. But nevertheless, uh, you definitely get the opportunity to visit and learn about places that you otherwise would not have known. And I've certainly learned something new as well uh, today. Now, I'm on my way to the helipad, and I think I might have passed it. I didn't see it on my way up, but I'm sure I'm following the track. Is that correct? It, yeah, you've gone past it, I think, uh, Andre. It's back on, back, um, I know we're getting this, um, there's a delay on the telecast we're getting, but I think you want to do a UE and go back and you'll find it on your left. Okay, I was looking for it, and I was like, ah, oh. <laughs> that's the thing, and that, and that's the thing here is, is you really have to, have to look. That's one of the more challenging aspects, especially about the airstrips, is that from a distance, you, you I, at least for me, I found myself second guessing: is that it or is that not it? And then you get closer and closer, and you're like, oh crap, that's it. Okay, I'm too fast, or I'm too high, or I've got to turn around and come back. Uh, and, and another thing about the strips, which I think one of you pointed out to me uh, earlier this week, is that the, uh, the airstrips are very deceptive. They're very deceptive. So on approach, you, you're kind of left with this thought, oh, it's too short, I'm not going to make it. And then right when you get down to almost uh, wheels down, then you realize, oh, wow, okay, I see there's more space than I thought, or there's less space than I thought. So. Um, or the gradient is steeper than, than I thought it would be. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it, it takes quite a bit of practice. And I've been practicing quite a bit uh, this week, and I'll definitely do some approaches today and show off the sceneries. And so hopefully I won't embarrass myself too much. Yeah, well, we, we embarrassed ourselves testing it nowhere, I can tell you. Um, I think I've got a recycled bin with about 300 twin otters in it. So, um, <laughs> you know... Um, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those places where um, it is a real hands-on uh, seat of the pan stuff. And um, I know when I learned to fly, um, I learned in ultralights and um, we, we flew with the attitude that um, uh, it wasn't a matter of, of um, if your uh, engine was going to fail, it was a matter of just when. Wow. So we used to practice, we used to practice landing in paddocks and, and, and all sorts of terrain and actually even had an, an, um, a fuel emergency while doing a, a trip around Queensland and we had to put it down um, in a paddock um, and um, it was pretty hairy because it was, a, it was in the middle of Queensland and there was nothing but pineapple plantations around and we, we were almost out of fuel and looking for a strip and we couldn't find one and um, we eventually landed in this um, this paddock, which had a uh, a lot of uh, unfore unforeseen holes in it, so we were bouncing from sort of one big melon hole to the next, but we survived it, walked away, 
uh, changed the bungee co cords on the undercarriage and away we went again, you know. Um, but for Tim and I, bush flying has always been um, what we love. Tim did a, a beautiful strip in Katoomba, which is just around the corner from him. And I'm, I, I remember seeing it and thinking, wow, you know, like this is, this is the sort of scenery that I really enjoy. Um, <clears throat> and it's surprising the, the number of bush flies that are coming out of the woodwork that you didn't know existed because up until now, um, if you didn't do an airport with um, an international terminal that, that they could land their NGXs on, it, um, sales suffered really, really quite badly. And I think this is what influenced John's decision to, to um, get us to add P uh, the Port Moresby to it. Um, and as I said, Tim did a fantastic job with, with it. But uh, you know, people have been sort of embracing the both sides of it, both the, both the international side and then the ability to jump in something smaller and go and have a bit of a, uh, a seat of the pants ride, you know. I think you've gone past it there again. I think I've right? passed it again. Yeah. I think it's at 12 o'clock now. I thought I had it a minute there, and then I got up close and realized it was another village. So there's a lot of small villages that you guys have added along the way, which help for uh, points of reference and knowing that you're going in the right direction because there's no I, – I don't have an official chart for the area. So for me, it's all visual. So I'm, I'm sort of yeah. relying on the aids that you guys have placed along the, uh, along the trail. I think, yeah, you, I think if you follow the trail <clears> – <throat> And stay fairly low on the trail. Um, the the the, rec the big feature that you can recognise with um, Isarava is um, the memorial. It sort of stands out. Um, and I just might add here, we were we could have added more more detail to this memorial, but out of respect for the Anzacs and for um, all of the all of the people connected with the um, um, armed services. We, we purposely kept it simple because we didn't want to feel like we were using their um, uh, history as a, as a sales gimmick. Uh, far yeah, far we, there we, you go. There you go we also have to be really careful because we've got some quite strict laws in Australia regarding profiting from um, the Anzacs. Um, so we're not actually allowed to sell a product that, you know, has that word in it or, or is based on that we can we can we can include the memorial because it is actually a, a, a point of interest um, that is visible from the air so um, but that was yeah we, we we couldn't start adding in uh, um, old battlefields and, and you know um, uh, gravestones and things like that just because yeah just out, out of respect as well absolutely um, I, I think looking at it from a slightly different perspective as well and I don't, I don't know if ignorance would be a proper coin to term, to term, I'm sorry, a proper coin to term it. Uh, but for me, definitely, these are things that, ooh, whoa, I'm losing control here. Oops. Ah, sorry. That's that's my is, problem. <laughs> I start looking nice. at the scenery and like, ooh, that looks really nice. And then, and then all of a sudden I'm, I'm out of control. Uh, but what I was saying was, is, uh, is I kind of wanted to hover right over the, uh, the memorial, is the fact that I think it also can stand for something where people who otherwise would not have known about it, may, would have never known anything about it, also have an opportunity to look at it and wonder, okay, what is that? What is its purpose? Go in and research it. And if anything, hopefully it, it may give a little bit more justice to what the purpose of a memorial is, is to, to make sure that you know, what happened uh, is not forgotten. So I think for it to be added in the simulator, which could be considered as a game for, more, for, for some people, for a lot of us, I don't think we would, we would ever consider it as a game. But certainly something to, to pay, if, if nothing else, more respect to. The fact that we can research and learn something more about something somewhere else on the other side of the world that we may not have necessarily, you know, been aware of otherwise. Yeah, just um, if anyone wants to learn anything more about this uh, or who's not familiar with it, um, I recommend uh, searching YouTube for Kokoda. And there's uh, three or four really good documentaries with original footage showing the, the battles and the struggles. Um, and, and, you know, back in World War II, this, this track was, was not, um, uh, you know, it was a, a lot worse than it is now um, and a lot more in, inhospitable. Um, nice landing. Oh, thank you. Yes, very. Nailed it. Let's see. Okay. 
I wish I could do there that. There was also an, an American involvement too in this this uh, battle as well. Um, I've got to try to turn it around now. <laughs> oh, I'm going to hit a tree. That that's that's a tight space to turn around in, unfortunately. Uh, so, Tim, you were, you were mentioning the American involvement as well. Unfortunately, <laughs> there's a lot that isn't covered, uh, I think, uh, just in our education, especially uh, a lot of conflicts that we were involved in uh, as, a, as a country, as America, that they actually do not cover in school, that you really don't learn about until after you've already graduated or, if you're, if, or when you go on to college and so on and so forth afterwards. So that's, that's very interesting to know. There was a lot of involvement with uh, the American Air Force um, uh, that they they also supplied a lot of the, the transport, um, a lot of the biscuit bombing, you know, the, the dropping of supplies to the troops along the track because it took um, you know a week to get anything up the track and it had to be carried um, you know on people's backs as they sort of crawled up the muddy slopes on their hands and knees. Um, so they did a lot of biscuit bombing into the, um, the Myola Flats, which are those big gr open grassy areas, which um, of, of interest actually are uh, uh, they're very volcanic soil, so nothing uh, tends to grow there except for the, the grass. Um, but that was where the, that was the scene where they did a lot of um, biscuit bombing of the supplies, just out ch chucking them out the door of the DC-3s. Um, and some, there's some great stories out. I mean, I've, I've read just about every Kokoda book that's around for just for history and for, um, for the background setting but um yeah it's it's littered with uh aircraft uh, wrecks from world war ii as well this this location there's um B b-25s and kitty hawks in a number of locations we, we obviously couldn't um Add them in, right. in, include any of those but uh you know just have, again out of, out of respect but um it's definitely a uh, uh, the, the American involvement was was quite large, um, but yeah, you guys probably don't know about it so much. Um, but it, it involved a lot of uh, uh, air transport help at Port Moresby, uh, which was known as Seven Mile Aerodrome then, uh, because it was seven miles from the capital at that point. I think it's now only about five miles. Uh, and also there were a, um, a regiment, or I'm not sure the, the term you use, a battalion of um, American troops as well that were involved there. Um, and I think your guys were also like our guys in that they were the, um, the, the uh, we call them the Home Guard or the, the Reserve Force. Um, I think you guys have got another name for that. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head. But yeah. Um, it was certainly a wild place for these guys to to uh, begin their uh, overseas deployment. Um, and everyone, there's a lot uh, of help. Sorry, Tim. Yes. I was going to say. I was um, just saying there was a lot of help from the Fuzzy Wuzzy. They call them the Fuzzy Wuzzy Angels. The the natives pl played a big role in helping the Aussies um, get through um, through this, didn't they, Tim? Yeah, um, that was a probably the only way that we managed to um, turn back the, the, the Japanese in this uh, uh, theatre was, was the help of the, the local guys, um, yeah, the Fuzzy Wuzzy Angels. And there were some um, horrific stories of, you know, people being carried back um, on the shoulders of these these guys for days on end on the backs of, uh, of these guys. They did a wonderful service. Um, and there's, there's actually a couple still remaining alive as well that that um, everyone visits as they go along the track to pay their respects to. It's actually something that I'm now thinking about adding for a future trip myself. I, you know, it's it's really unfortunate because for us over here, I mean, you know, these stories sort of get lost in the Iwo Jimas and the Hiroshimas and Nagasaki's and then, of course, our, our presence in, in Europe as well. Uh, a lot, of, I, I suppose... For, I can't tell you why that this wouldn't be covered in, in, in schools locally here, especially to the extent it's covered there. I mean, naturally, this was something that was much closer to home uh, for you all. Uh, but nevertheless, it's, it's, it's an, an important part of history, uh, definitely an important part of the war. So I, I think what the two of you have done, if I add my own opinion to it, is I think you've brought in, you, you, you've, you've taken something that 
maybe a lot of people didn't know about and sort of brought it to light. So if nothing else, I hope it, it gives it further justice as opposed to a thought that it could be considered disrespectful by recreating such a thing virtually, uh, is that hopefully more people will be influenced and, and inspired to, to research and, and, and learn more uh, about what took place here and about uh, the people who make this pilgrimage every year. It's, it's very important. Well, it was actually a uh, wasn't very well known in Australia either um, until probably about um, ten, fifteen years ago, um, when more attention was started to be placed upon it because of the um, anniversaries started coming up, the major anniversaries, the fifty years and the sixty years, um, and you know, as a nation in Australia, we've always we've always talked about Gallipoli, which was a, a World War One event, um, which was you know an, an absolute disaster really from the humanitarian point of view um, and, and so was uh, Papua New Guinea for that, for that matter but um, it, it's been made a lot more popular obviously there's been some uh, there's a, there was a, a pretty good movie that came out Australian movie um, called Kokoda um, and so you know it's, I'd say in the last sort of uh, 15 years um, it's really started to almost uh, rival um, Gallipoli in, in terms of you know our, our greatest moments or something um, uh, notably, uh, the battle on the Kokoda Trail was actually the first uh, time that the Japanese got pushed back in, in World War Two. I mean, up, up to that point, they'd been uh, completely unstoppable, and, um, and and admittedly, the force that were in Papua New Guinea were, uh, you know, a crack uh, Marine invasion force. They were highly trained, um, really, really well equipped for jungle uh, warfare and. The poor guys that we sent there were the, you know, were the home guard. Um, because of Papua, Papua New Guinea was an Australian territory up until the 70s, uh, it, it, um, it was, you know, we had a home guard here and the, the, the rule was that they, they were not allowed to be sent out of the country. So um, Papua New Guinea was determined as still part of the country. So all the, the you know, farmers, lads and all the guys who called up to help at the last minute um, all got sent to uh, Papua New Guinea to fight, and so most of the the early battles at, you know, on the Kokoda track were just literally, um, you know, guys with guns, um, as all of our main, you know, battle-hardened, um, proper uh, Australian infantry force were all stuck in in Africa and Palestine, and um, and so yeah, it was, it was those those guys that, that pushed them back, and then obviously the, the proper AIF came in. Um, uh, sort of mid midway through the piece, because we we ended up fighting a massive uh, withdrawal, um, you know, a, a ta tactical withdrawal, and we got back to within sight of uh, Port Moresby, um, and, and then uh, it wasn't until the proper army turned up with, um, that we actually managed to start pushing them back again. But uh, yeah, no, I, I, I you know I, I love history and geography, so this is all up my alley. That's very terrific. I'm actually getting a, a, a very interesting history lesson myself. In fact, uh, history is my favorite subject, especially World War II. I'm uh, a huge World War II buff. So just to learn more about what I didn't know, I think it's great. Um, okay, so this is where we are now. Uh, we're going to cross our fingers and hope we don't get an out-of-memory error. If we do, we'll just fire back up. But now we're making the tradition uh, from the helicopter right on into the, uh, the twatter. So, Tim, I'm just looking for your repaint. Now, this is your paint, is that correct? Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Let me see. There's a funny name. Is it Jan Keys? Is that correct? That's the, um, he's quite a prolific painter. Okay, That's there we go. That's not me, though. Oh, this, so this isn't yours? Uh, I did the Southwest one. Oh, Jan I Keys see. Did the Airlines PNG. It's prettier. It's got a lovely bird of paradise on the tail. It's my favourite. <laughs> it's got bird. Okay. It's got bird, yeah. Um, the Twin Otter is actually a really tricky uh, uh, paint kit to use, and uh, I've actually opened it up uh, half a dozen times with um, this is Janky's one. I've actually opened it up half a dozen times with the you know great dreams of painting all sorts of wonderful schemes on it, and always uh, you know closed it down again afterwards going oh too difficult <laughs> for today and uh and then yeah so i just opened it up again and went right i'm gonna do this and, oh. uh, so yeah it's, I'm, I, I want to do more now now can you give me some advice i have my map here and i'm assuming 
that I'm at Kagi, but I might be wrong. It could be Ifogi. Is it Kagi? Kagi. Okay. Now, great. If, if you'd like to simulate, I, th I believe it's the world's shortest commercial flight, PNG, or in anywhere. It's um, you fly from Kagi, or from Ifogi to Kagi, or Kagi to Ifogi. It's um, around about a 90 second flight. I think we do it slightly quicker in the sim. Um, and then, um, yeah, we can take it from, from there. But it's a, it's, a, it's a fairly common flight, this. I think they use something like bus tickets. There's airline tickets there. You see them collecting these little coupons and they take them on board chickens and a bunch of bananas, whatever. But the, the trek is actually um, between the two towns. Is, it takes them so long that it's, it's much easier just to jump on the on the local taxi aircraft and, and fly it in 90 seconds. All right, so, so I'm assuming it's to, behind me, you, is that right? No, if you, if you just keep the runway heading yep. and just veer over to your left, and it's that almost, it's just like a two-tone, there's some darker green grass at the start of the runway, and um, uh, the, there's a village up to the left, uh, it's a very dirt it's very, like they play rugby and all sorts of things on that dirt strip, on that dirt paddock in the in the middle of the town. So it doesn't get the give the grass much of a chance to grow. So um, yeah, just I'll, I'll I'll direct you. Um, just head straight off runway heading and veer about to your say nine o'clock, no, ten o'clock, and ease off on the power. Um, you won't need you'll be because it's downhill, so you'll be pretty much having. Just um, as soon as you've taken off, he's back on the power and just coast in. Okay, I think I actually see it here, right off to my immediate left. That's not... I think that's the one. Yep. Immediate left is... Um, the Donomo, I think? No, uh, Lonomo. God, I get these names confused. Oh, I might okay, be approaching there, the wrong airfield then. <laughs> there you go. You sit on just over on the left there now. You see that bright green patch? Okay, this is the correct airfield then. Okay, perfect. Yep. Oh, that's a short one. <laughs> yep, yep. Thanks for the advice about the power because uh, I, I was I was ready to go. Now, I, I've already stalled on this airport once, and I'm already below stall speed as we speak. So uh, hopefully I don't crash it again here. Yeah. Well, let's see, it, Actually, it, I came in a bit high. Yeah. It's, it's very – this is a – Tim and I used to overshoot this all the time. Believe it or not, it, 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 it's this is the it this it uh. makes you think it's easy, but it's not. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> I think I, I veered off a little to the left there, or off the uh, runway. Yeah. It's it's not as easy as it looks. No. no, that's a good one. That's a good one. Okay, I'm stuck on the hill. Now this is the other problem that I that I had to learn is that you have to be careful. There, there's a thought that you want to hurry up and slow down because you don't want to overshoot the runway and go into the bush. But on the same token, if you slow down too soon, you'll get stuck. So that's <laughs> <laughs> and I've gotten stuck already. So that it's not fun uh, once you get stuck. Now you just oh well, you just press the slow button and push it up to the. And <laughs> just slew it up. I know that dreaded okay. slew button. I tell you, I try so hard not to touch that. I really do. Oh, uh, well, let's see. <laughs> but, but see, the way, I, the way I look at it is that flight sims have limitations. And as, as much as they would like to make it um, as accurate as possible, it's impossible. I mean, you wouldn't get stuck in the real world. The, 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 the Twin Otter would have plenty of power to get up there. Ooh. But, this is one of our limitations here. We get we get the bouncy here. Okay. I'm gonna line her up, uh, Ken, and then you want to give me uh, the next heading for us. Oh, I reckon Tim ought to do the next one. Tim. Okay. Soon <laughs> if I if I can if I can manage to line it up here. No, you go for it, Ken. These are all yours. Uh, oh, okay. Um, all right. Well, um, all right. Let's go. Let's go. Um, Bonamu. So if you take off and make a right-hand turn, or actually probably do a do a left-hand circuit over the top of um, of um, Ifogi, okay. And if you follow um, straight over from Ifogi Village, you'll see Bonamo. It's that Bonamo is the one that's on the sort of crest of the hill. You can sort of it looks very short, but it's actually longer than it is. 
than it looks, and it's sort of, you can actually land this one from either direction, one of the few that you can do from both directions. You said it, which, um, which, what's the name again? Uh, Lonamu. Uh, how do you spell it? I'm, I'm just looking at it on my map, um, just so I get an idea of what direction. L-A, L-A-U-N. Oh, okay, here we go. Okay, so that's going to be straight out, and then I think that's a right turn, is that correct? Or is that a left turn? Uh, well, probably the easiest way to, to you, you want to give yourself a bit of a chance to get an approach. If you try and go, if you, if you take off and just go right, I think you're going to end up uh, getting into all sorts of trouble. I'd be, I'd be taking off and doing a left-hand circuit I and see. coming in over the, over the top of the fogey, um, which is just to the right of you. The, the actual village is just to the right of you, if you look, you know. Um, and um, and there, it just gives you a bit of time to set yourself up okay. for that approach. Let's do that. And I apologize in advance. Uh, you guys gave me some advice to remove the control tower view because every time I hit it, the scenery has to reload. So uh, I, I didn't take the time to do that, and I, I completely forgot. So my fault. For some of you, if you're, if you're noticing the scenery is reloading, that's because the control tower view is, is, is screwing with the scenery, and that's something that I was supposed to fix before I started. So that's Smart. my fault. The, the, okay. There is another way you can you can um, change views. I just go right click on the screen and and just go, you know, spot or whatever. Good point. Then, we'll do that. Right, right. That's a good point. Okay, here we go. So okay, we'll take off. We'll make a left circuit, and then we'll turn around and come back in. Now, because you're watching me on a delay, you probably won't see it until after me. So that's the only. I know. Concern. I know. I gotta tell you, keeping it uh, centered on the runway is difficult as well, on these runways because they not only are they not flat like there's a gradient, but there's also they're they're sort of sloped from side to side as well. Yep. Yeah, the, the tennis is slight. It's just slight to the left on this one. But that's the great thing about the twin otter is it's it's got enough power to make it happen. That's why I love this plane. <laughs> Aerosoft did an, a, a magnificent job with this aircraft. They oh, it's, really it's, did. It's, it's, it's hands down my favourite. It is just uh, I, I love the first version, um, uh, but this is this is I mean this is probably my favourite aircraft in the, in the sim completely. I just love the detail. It's the incredibly the versatile too. Control panel at the front there, um, and yeah, it's great sound. Um, I think they did a wonderful job on it. As a matter of fact, I uh, featured this. I was practicing some approaches over at uh, St. Bartholomew Airport in the Caribbean, and that's a, a very difficult approach, uh, uh, a uh, project by Fly Tampa. And I remember there were two there were two guys watching, and they saw me whip out the twatter, and they go, "What's that?" They hadn't seen it before, and they went out and bought it that moment. So I thought that was really funny. They were busy searching online for. Uh, for the best price, and went out and bought it, and they 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 love it. So I thought that was incredible. I thought, oh well, hey, this, these uh, sort of and daily it, streams are are doing some good. And and the thing about it is that you you have to manage your power extremely carefully because um, the 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 uh, turbines take a while to spool up. Yeah, they so do. So you you reduce your power, and then you find yourself in a situation like I of how I've done so many times. I end up stalling because um, instead of using the, f the feather to uh, adjust my power, I've been using the throttle, and that's just not the way to go. You can get yourself in all sorts of trouble. Okay, so from what I can see here, now that strip that I can see there, that's actually um, where you've been before, um, over on the left there, but further, it's more to the right, I think, than where you are now. Um. Well, I've got two strips in my immediate vision, so I'm hoping the one, by the on time the, right. the uh, is it the one that I'm passing on the right now to my immediate right? It's going to take um. you a second to get to the delay, but um, worst case scenario, because I think the one that I'm looking at now on my right is uh, the one that we've that's approached Kagi. already. Yeah, that's Kagi, yeah. Um, okay, fly past Kagi. And you can approach it from the other side, so um, yeah, I'd reduce power, I'd reduce height a bit, a little bit high there, and it's it's probably a, from what I can see, it's um, if you take a line sort of perpendicular from Kagi uh, Lonomo's over on uh, over on the other side to the right. 
So I gather by the time you catch this, because I'm already on approach to one of the airfields already. So. Okay, this is this is this is Madonna, mate. You're coming into now. So okay, that's fine. That's the thing. They're so close together that it, it's almost confusing. It's like, mm, is it this one? Is it that one? It's now this is the one that I got stuck on before. Yeah, this is the one that looks flat, but it's actually quite steep. It's very <laughs> steep. So the mistake it's... I made was was coming off and breaking too soon. And then I, uh, I didn't have enough power to get up the hill. Yep. Your landings are very good. So. I've been trying to practice a bit, but i got to be honest. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think I'm still quite a bit rusty here. Well, I think this is one of the, one of the, one of the things that um, we all love about bush flying is that you, you, you do have to practice. It's, it's, um, you can't just you know do it first first time and you get bored with it you know this you, you really have to fly the thing down onto the ground okay so i've gotten stuck again <laughs> i thought this time i gave it more power but no I, I i got stuck again and i i i tried to take it all the way through the end but uh i'm gonna try to do this a funny way and try to back it up like a car which is sort of what i did before and, uh, oh, but then I strike the tail, so that's... <laughs> yeah, that, that last little bit up the top there is extremely steep. Um... Come on. Oh, she's trying, but she just doesn't have enough. Okay. Uh, well, we were, it, we're probably going to have to hit that slew button. You're going you're gonna to have to get over your fear of the slew button. Yeah, yep, yeah, because I'm stuck. Okay. Here we go. I'm gonna hit the slew. I don't think I don't think anyone of us has ever um, not used a slew key. No? So <laughs> I think it's I think it's it's one of the. It's um, gonna be compulsory the, up here. I think so. I think so. Till you till you really master it, I think. Um, otherwise, it's yeah, trying to do um, reverse. Okay, you know what? I'm just point, gonna go ahead and the downside is, is once I'm on that hill, it's going to roll whether I like it or not. Parking brake or not, it's, it's going to go for it. So yeah. I just figure that's yeah. just, let's just try to get it off yeah. uh, off the ground here and try to find the other airport if we can this time. Try to find the correct yeah. one. Yeah, you, you might as well go to uh, Tim Kenemo. It's probably the most famous strip in... Um, oh, is that that's uh, the steep hill, is that right? That's the steep hill, yeah. Okay. Um, no one's actually worked out how that strip got named. We've been waiting for someone to, to twig on, but they haven't, um, they haven't as yet. Well, I'll say this. I remember when Aerosoft first released the, uh, the Lukla airfield, and I'm one of those people, and I'll admit, I don't always read the, uh, the manual. So it I does. was, uh, it, it got to the point where all I was doing was just find the approach, turn around on the deck, take off, turn around again in the valley, land again, and doing that back and forth, back and forth. I mean, we're talking as far back as the old Lago Twin Otter, if you, if you guys remember that long ago. Uh, just doing those approaches over and over. And then one day I decided to go exploring, and what I found out was they actually modeled in a couple of other airfields up there as well. Well, see, real men don't read instructions. That's, that's there. You go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it's considered a sign of weakness. Um, reading instructions. Okay, well, I was being very strong there then because <laughs> I had no clue, and uh, so I was in love with the scenery for for maybe three or four years, just doing those approaches, and then at some point, uh, I got a little bored with it. Uh, just because once you get good at something and it's not a challenge anymore, then it's like, okay, well, I've been there, done that, what's new? And I, I think this is the next big thing, for, uh, especially for uh, challenging approaches. Uh, this is it. This really is. And it was that Lucla scenery that was one of the, the few sceneries that really got me into VFR. There you are. Right uh, in front VFR. of you now is, that's, that's um, Lonoma, right in front of you now. Okay, so I've already passed it, so we'll go ahead and do the hill, and then we'll come back and do Monomo now that visually I've seen where it is. Yep. One, one tip I've got for coming into these, I mean, uh, I'd probably advise against trying to do like a tour of one, one after each other because you'll end up circling around and, and, and sort of miss, keep missing them. But if you, if, you, if you have like a couple that you, you line up that you're going to do, 
um, I've always found the best way to get into them is to come in really, really low and just follow the, the tree line up, up the valley and so you're actually climbing up into the strip as opposed to kind of trying to drop your plane down onto it. Um, I, I don't know if that's the official um, practice or not, but I find it a lot easier to climb. No, you're absolutely strips. right. because that, And that's sort of uh, what I touched on at the beginning of the stream is that from when you're high, you're not sure if it's an airstrip or not. And it's not until you get close to it that you realize, okay, yes, that is. And uh, because, right, it could just be simply one of the many different uh, color variations in the terrain. So it, it's difficult to tell what's what, and if, especially if it's your first time in. Uh, now that I've been in here a few times, I've sort of been able to tell what's an airstrip and what's a, you know, a color variation because it's not until you get pretty, you know, fairly close to them do you realize, okay, this is, a, this is definitely the strip that I'm looking for. Uh, don't tell your flying instructor that you do that. <laughs> um, because it's a no-no. No. It's a no-no. No, no. You, you, you have to assume that you're going to lose your, your engine on approach, and this, therefore, if you've got to come in under power, um, it's not the safest procedure. But you know, now can I fly sim and we can walk away from any landing? Yep. Right now, I'm assuming you're a pilot yourself. Is that correct? You have some interesting stories. Um. Yeah, well, I, I, I learned to fly, I think, when I was about 40. I uh, finally got enough money to be able to, um, to learn to fly ultralights. And I had an amazing instructor. He would, he would, he'd been a pilot with, um, with uh, Eastern Airlines of New South Wales um, for a number of years, and he had thousands of hours. And, and he was one of these guys that he was so confident in his ability to correct the students' mistakes, that he would let you get into some of the worst situations because he knew that he could get out of it if you couldn't. Wow. And, and um, yeah, I, I, just, I just found him the most... Um, he, his name's um, Paul Cook. Um, uh, sorry, Paul... Oh, gee, I've forgotten that 20 years ago. Paul Crowfoot, I think it is. Um, and he, he just it really... Uh, gave me a fantastic grounding on on, on flying, and um, uh, before he let us take his plane around Queensland, um, he he made us do a meteorological course. Uh, he had a mate that actually writes the exams for the for the local um, 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 testing f facilities over here, and and this guy just in in 24 hours um, crammed as much information as he possibly could about reading the weather and um, it really came in handy um, and yeah but uh, we, we did a trip around Queensland and we landed on beaches uh, we landed in some of the worst possible strips you can imagine Wow um, uh, one of the one of the hairiest moments though was um, we we got we had engine problems at Longreach um, and we, we weren't able to um, keep up with the group. So while we were waiting for a, a part to be flown in for us, what we did was um, uh, we got to you know, wander around Longreach and, and we, the guy that was putting us up there for, the, for a couple of days actually owned the, uh, or was leasing <laughs> the famous Qantas hangar. And anyway, um, to catch up, we had to do a, a bit of a detour and we went straight across from uh, long reach to a place called Hewenden, which was not on the on the normal route, and um, so what we ended up, he, what he's going, the guy's name was Peter, and he, what he did was Ouch. he followed us out to a place called Mutterborough, where they where they discovered the Mutterboroughsaurus. It's a, um, one of the few dinosaurs that they've dug up in Australia, and you know, you land on that strip, and there's you're actually dodging kangaroos, believe it or not. Um, they're not on the main street uh, of, of Sydney. They're actually on the runway at Matavara. But he no actually kidding. followed us out with. Uh, he actually followed us out there with some fuel, and and he he, he gave us a word of advice when we left Matavara because we still had a three-hour flight from there to, to Hewenden. And he said, "Look, just hold your your compass heading. Don't even try to read the map because it's nothing like what you'll see." And I'm thinking, "Yeah, well, you know." Right. Fair enough, okay. Take it with a grain of salt. And even at 700 feet, the, the, the creek that I was going to follow turned into this 
but it's called Channel Country, and it's just uh, thousands of, of fingers of streams going out all over the place. So I thought, okay, well I can't, I can't follow the creek. Um, I'll use the road. And the the farmers out there, they don't care about roads; they just drive anywhere. So when you get up, you know, to any altitude, that road turns into just tracks going everywhere. So I realised very quickly that there was no way I was going to follow either the creek or the road. So um, we picked our compass heading and um, flew it. And um, we didn't find, to cut a long story short, we didn't find Huond until about 10 minutes before last light. And we were thinking, oh wow, we're going to have to put it, we're going to have to put it down in the in the scrub here, um, and and wait till morning. But luckily, um, about 10 minutes before last light, we saw the sun hitting one of the silos uh, and it shone out like the most welcome light you've ever seen. <laughs> and we it's just, a gift from God we almost, there. We almost cheered and we thought, new beauty, you know. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we, 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 we had some great adventures on that flight. We, we, we um, had to divert around some really foul weather at a place called Tully up in northern Queensland, which is just before we got to Cairns. And it had, it's known for the highest rainfall in Australia. They've actually got uh, rainwater farms there, and um, yeah, we were the we again we had local knowledge and um, uh, the, the the maintenance guy at um, a place called Ingham said, whatever you do, don't go direct, go follow the coast. For some reason, the rain goes inland, and it sort of misses out on the coast. So, so we thought beauty, you know. So we we followed the coast, and we we were flying down at around about 800 feet staying under the clouds because there wasn't like there were really bad weather it's always bad weather up there and we were hearing radio calls coming in from the rest of the guys in the in the uh, group uh, having to put down at tully having the uh, bad weather Ouch. you know they're all landing at tully and we were because we were skirting out by the coast we actually made it to um innisfail our, our, our next stop um and and beat them there so yeah but yeah that was a that was a a great trip um, and as I said you, you know so we, we had more engine problems at Cairns and we, we, we couldn't go on but some of the guys went up to Horn Island um, which is very close to Papua you just go across Torres Strait over to Papua um, and um, yeah it was, it was you know it was just a just a dream come true to be able to spend that many hours um, in a an aircraft in some of the remotest places of Australia it was it was it was brilliant. Loved it. That's amazing. I mean, you're, you're an inspiration. I just want to come down and fly with you. I could talk to you for hours, literally. Oh man, that that is incredible. Well, uh, if you're watching, uh, I've overshot. <laughs> so that's that's my official, I think, first crash up here. Um, I have to be honest. I mean, of, of all the the pilots that I know. Um, from around the world, I, I, I think Australia is definitely probably one of the most interesting places in the world. Uh, I think to fly just with the different uh, the different types of terrain and 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 uh, uh, it's very very interesting. Unfortunately, I haven't had the opportunity yet. So, but uh, Misha, who's who's uh, one of the the Orbix developers, he's uh, sending me pictures of his flights, you know, in and around Sydney, and it's a beautiful place to fly over. Uh, gorgeous from the sky, without a doubt. Yeah, I don't like cities much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a, I'm a, I'm, I like the bush myself, but, but um, absolutely. Yeah, we, as, as part of my training, I had to, I had to do a, a nav flight from um, a place called Warnervale on the Central Coast, which is about 50, 50 miles north of Sydney, and there's a laneway, um, and because of the jet aircraft flying. Uh, approaches to, to mascot from there you have to stay uh, at 500 feet and they've actually got beacons and you follow the flashing beacons um, through this laneway um, so that you don't interfere with the the, the, the um, commercial traffic coming in coming and going from Sydney I see. But yeah it is it is very beautiful the Hawkesby River and and um, you have to show me some pictures sometime yeah for sure now, I'm assuming this is Lenumu, is that correct? Yep. Perfect. So, uh, let's see, we've done Kagi, we've done Ifogi, 
uh, I think we've done Bon. Oh, here we go. Uh, Bodhi Numo, is that correct? I'm sorry, I'm really butchering these names here. I'm not sure how um, they, but Bodimo, I think it is. Bodimo. Anyway. Um, we're all the same boat. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So I think the next stop then is uh, Bordy, is that right? I think Bordy, that's right. Yep. Uh, and I think if I depart off this runway, I think it's a right turn over uh, Tim Canumo, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. But you might be able to uh, help better direct me. Yeah, that's that sounds pretty good to me. Okay. So I'm sure you saw that uh, that overshoot that I did there. That was uh, that was pretty bad. <laughs> That's actually yeah, the well, first time I've had I've used the thrust reversers, believe it or not. I've tried to make it a point of coming in uh, just above stall to avoid having to do that, but Yeah, well, um, you know, this is this is the beauty of it, you know. Um, you, don't, you you don't always nail it. And that makes you want to come back and try it again. Absolutely. I almost want to do it now, but for the sake of time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't take failure too well. It's like you know what? I'll, I'll do this all day till I get it right, or I won't sleep. Okay, here we go. All right. So let's see. I think we are going to hang a right turn, if I'm not mistaken. And it's I, right hand turn. And to be honest, uh, these two last airstrips. Actually, I think there's three more. There's one which is uh, the, the abandoned airstrip, and we'll, we'll leave something to the imagination for those who haven't purchased the product yet to go out and look at the abandoned airstrip, but you guys have added uh, some objects uh, out there as well. Uh, not as challenging, but certainly a worthwhile visit nonetheless. Uh, but now these two, these two particular airstrips, um, which are relatively close to each other, which is... Uh, Bordy and Malay, Malai maybe. I haven't yep. been to either one of these yet, so I'll be approaching these for the very first time yep. uh, uh, live. The, well, the, the, the people watching are in for a treat with Burini, I think. Um, I don't, uh, one of the one of the one of the guys on the forums actually mentioned that he he wasn't using a twin auto though, so that's that's cheating. Oh. Um, but um, the the twin auto is probably. Um, one of the most difficult planes to get in to these um, of the bush. It's a great bush plane, but you really have to, you really got to practice and nail it, you know? Um, something like a C-185 uh, tail dragon, you can, you can pretty much get into most of these and, because it is, it's smaller, it's, you don't have to, the, the, the spooling up problem with the with thing, you can just add power when you have to. Um, but Buridi is a really tough strip. Um, I'm taking bets that you're going to go slewing off to the left-hand side of the strip as you come in. Um, but uh, I don't <laughs> I'm only kidding. Um, but yeah, it is. It is one of the most challenging. Um, but it's for that reason, it's one of my favourites. I think it's Tim's favourite too. Um, yeah, well, I, I it, believe just, I found it, but I could be wrong. I don't know where you guys are on the stream, but. I feel like I've got my eye on it now. Uh, I can't see it on the screen. No, you, I think you're further away than that. No, it's um, it's it'll be, it'll be on your right, and it's 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 you recognise it by its it's quite a rich orange, orangey earth colour. Um, it's not a two-way airship, is that correct? No, uh, it's you, you come in uphill. And one of the guys described it as a dog leg to the right for all those golfers out there. Okay. Um, but don't don't try and cut the corner because you won't make it. Okay. Well, the airship I'm looking at now it doesn't actually have a corner. I'm I'm wondering if I'm even looking at an airship. I feel like I am. I'll tell you what. I'll pa I'll go ahead and pass it, and then by the time you see it on the screen, you can tell me if that's one of the uh, the airstrips. Yeah. And then I can come back and approach again. But maybe it's not an airstrip. <laughs> I want to look around a bit so I can get my bearings. Sure. One thing with the twin otter that I've found is quite handy is, is to um, to keep the power on full, so you've always got the power there. But to use the uh, prop tilt uh, levers to reduce the, the, the thrust, um, because yeah, the, the spooling up is quite an issue. But I know it's the same with the, the uh, default caravan. Um, it's always got me a cropper. Um, it, probably easier if you've got one of those little joystick 
uh, throttle things uh, to be able to do it. Cause yeah, the, the new side tech actually is nice for that. Controls in the, in the yeah. cockpit with the VC, it's quite hard with the mouse, especially if your cockpit's jumping around. Which is definitely the case here. <laughs> Well, okay, if I, if I pan behind us, um, hopefully this gives you some bearings now. You should be able to see the scenery now from this point of view. Hopefully the screen uh, isn't too pixelated. No, that screen's coming in great. I'm just lost. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've just, I've just turned the aircraft into position, so you should be able to find uh, where we are now. You're going to have to start. You're going to have to flip. Uh, hang on. Did I say to, the, to your right there? Or I'll do it's this. I'll to, come back over it's hard to, to talk um, and concentrate. Oh, it's okay. And there's, it's the old, the old men's problem. We can't do two things at once. You can fly, or you can talk. Right. You can't do both. And you can see I'm trying to do both, and I'm failing miserably. I'll take us back over to uh, Tim Canumo, and then um, hopefully you'll get your bearings from there. I think that might be a good, a good starting point. Yeah. They, well, there's Kagi. I can see Kagi. So you've still got a head. Uh, you've got to make a right-hand turn. Um, if you line up with Kagi, uh, sorry, Ifogi, um, getting mixed up myself, and sort of follow the follow the the, the runway heading of Ifogi. Um, okay. Right, right below you is is one. There it is. Oh, there it is. Just found it. Oh, it's in a canyon. Okay, no, it's, it's not. Reach. <laughs> what I'm looking at now, I see something. It looks like it's it's not at the top of a hill. Yep. It's at the base of a I hill, think, though. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah it, it, it follows the ridge line. Yeah, I can see. Yeah, I can see um, Bridge Village there below you. And that's that's merely off to your right. Yep. See, I'll you stick with the internal view until until it comes into view for you guys. Are you guys at the internal view uh, looking uh, from the top of the aircraft down? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so which is that? That's merely, <clears throat> merely down under your right wing. Okay. Right can sit at the moment. So if you do a, uh, about a, you know, go almost um, the runway heading of merely but back the other way, um, that'll, that'll take you to Buridi. And then you'll see it, it's... it's Oh, I see it now. I just found it. There it is. It is orangey. Okay. There we go. Okay. And I did... It's 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 kind of sliding off the edge of the cliff there. It is. God, whose idea was it to decide they were going to fly airplanes in here? <laughs> um, oh, my goodness. Was Who was the Tim, first guy Tim. to do that? I don't know. Um, it's like the first guy who decided I'm going to milk a cow and drink whatever comes out. It's like, who was the first guy that said, you know what, I'm going to land a twatter up here one day and it's going to happen. Well, when, can you imagine trying to build roads in this oh, terrain? Oh, my goodness. No. So it, I think necessity was the mother of invention here. I think yeah. uh, the only way they were going to get um, any kind of um, transportation going um, you know, is, is to put these little bush trips in. And all credit to these am amazing bush pilots that that do this on a regular basis and and, um, and do it so well. And uh, can you imagine having a having a, um, a plane full of, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, natives and, and, and with their chickens and, you know, all the, all the, all the you know, like it's, it's their it whole lives. So different, you know? Yeah. That's incredible. I'm, I'm uh, making kind of a long left turn around to try to uh, drop some altitude here and yeah. lead off a bit of speed now that I uh, mentally know where it is. And then we'll turn back around and try to approach it. Yeah, I can see though the the left side of the runway sort of dips off the side of the mountain. So I, I guess you can't approach it straight on. You have to sort of angle the aircraft along the terrain. I'm assuming. 
Yeah, I, I, I tend to um, it, line up a straight approach and not you, not try and turn the aircraft. Oh, really? Once you touch okay. down. Yeah, so in other words, come in a little bit to the right, um, um, a, a little bit to the left, and, and have you sort of angling slightly right. Um, if that makes, does that make any sense? Um, so that you, you, so in other words, imagine a straight line from slightly on the left-hand side of the of the of the strip at the at the touchdown point, um, aiming to cut the corner slightly, but don't cut the corner if you know what I mean. Like okay. stay, yeah. It, it's it's one of those that you know, it's it's three times the charm I think usually. Well, it's probably going to be the case here. So, uh, for those of you who are watching, uh, prepare to uh, to watch me crash. <laughs> I haven't I haven't done this yeah. one yet, and it's proof because I didn't even know how to get here. So, uh, get this the is popcorn out, guys. <laughs> this is this is it. This is it. Um, I I was quickly looking at the laptop here, and someone was pointing out the uh, the airports up in the uh, French Alps by LLH Creations, and yeah, I actually forgot to mention that. Uh, for me, though, I've actually mastered all of those airports long ago, so whereas I still enjoy them, uh, the uh, the challenging element is, is sort of gone from it. So I'm not as challenged anymore by those airports, and I mean, I've had them for a number of years just uh, flying them in FS9, but uh, I definitely still enjoy them. They're, they're very scenic, and they're a lot of fun, and I definitely go for them when I'm looking for a change of scenery. But I've mastered those, and I think it's going to take me quite a bit of time to master these as well. Now, right now, I'm just looking at where the threshold of the airstrip is. Uh, it's sort of odd, actually, because, right, it is in a corner. And you said not to try to cut the corner, so to, it, it, the point is to approach it straight onto the threshold. Is that correct, Ken? No, 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 no. But come in slightly, slightly to the left of the threshold. Oh, I see, so that, I see. So that, so that you're not... Because if you look at it, it's, it, that's a sharp corner uh, as you come straight in straight on. And uh, I don't think you... I've never been able to, to, to take that corner. If I touch down, coming in at, following the actual um, approach angle, I can never turn it. So what I do is I, I come in a bit from the left-hand side I and see. touch down a little bit later, cutting off that first little bit of the, of the touchdown zone so that you, you're, you're more lined up. You've got more chance of being able to make it that way. And maximizing the space of the, uh, the airstrip. I, I see what And you there's mean. plenty of, there's, there's actually quite a bit of room, and it's, there's a lot of uphill, so you'll, you'll, you'll see when you get there that you've still got plenty of time to slow down. Now, am I likely to get stuck on this uh, on this hill? Is it a, is it a steep um, less gradient? Less likely with this one. I know I shouldn't ask you. I should just one. see it and, and, and fail. But <laughs> I'm compelled to ask. I don't think I've got. I don't think that's been a problem for me with this one. I'm running off the corner, ending up down in the gully on the left. Is my favourite trick with this one. <laughs> Here we go, guys. <laughs> All right, wheels down. Oh, that was hard. Ouch. That was hard. Okay. Well, I think I upset some chickens. <laughs> We're still watching it. Okay, you're still watching still it. Yeah, I, I watching. came down really hard. It's all looking good so far here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's looking very good. How could this go wrong? <laughs> I'd call that a, a, a good landing. <laughs> I don't... Uh... Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty good. pretty good. I felt like I hit that pretty hard. I, I, I felt it. I almost felt like I pulled a G or two on my stomach just as I was uh, coming down. Now, somehow, yeah, I, I've managed to get myself stuck again. Let's see. It looks like she's trying to inch her way up the hill, but very slowly. Yeah. It seems to be a different uh, thing with different planes. Um, I was doing some testing of that very late in the piece. Um, and... I found that the default caravan seemed to have no problems going anywhere. Uh, really? Because at first I thought it might have been a tricycle uh, gear problem. Uh -huh. um, uh, and then I was trying with the, the, the default Cessna 172, and that just didn't seem to have enough power to operate up here properly. Um, but the default caravan seemed to be a bit like a Jeep uh, in comparison. But yeah, keeping the speed up... Um, 
whenever I've approached these strips, I always come in, and, and as soon as the um, as soon as the front wheel goes over the beginning of the strip, I hit the reverse thrust, um, and as soon as the, I start feeling the the, the the reverse thrust kick in, um, I actually kill it again to to stop, so I can keep a bit of momentum to get up to the top of the strip, because you want to get up to the top, and then at least swing around so that you're um, sideways on the top of the strip, so you can park. If you can park, right? I remember talking to you about then, that before. And then you've got the opportunity to, to roll around and, and, and leave again. This this one's got a nice little level spot at the top there to sit. This one does, yeah. I think I've got a little bit of place to uh, turn around here. Um, I think I'll definitely get the Coronados a try. I wonder how the Islander would would operate up here. I'm sort of I'm sort um, of tempted to try that. Yeah, I, I've, I've got that. It's one of my, one of my favorite little planes. I, I love I've it. Actually, I've, I had it installed for a while. Um, as a developer, we we do lots of reinstall, you know, fresh clean installs of um, FSX because we're always stuffing it up with, with dodgy files and testing things for other people. And um, so, we, you know, I generally reinstall my FSX uh, three, four times a year. Yeah. Um, and so you kind of get a bit tired of reinstalling everything again, uh, and you tend, tend to just put on what you need to use. All right, now. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, just really quickly now, for the sake of argument, I, I feel like um, I'm going to have trouble taking off. I think I'm going to have to hit that off. slew button again. Otherwise, I'll spend a half an hour trying to, to, to uh, maneuver it into the correct position. But I think I need to be in this far corner in order to Make maximize sure you're using the full length. Some flaps too. Oh, yeah, I haven't put the flaps down yet. But I think I'm, gonna, I'm just going to slew over to the side a little bit. Because I feel like I'm going to fail if I try to just take straight off from where I'm sitting now. Let's see. I'm going to cheat and back it up a little bit too and give myself some more runway. So for those of you who are watching, uh, hopefully this is giving you something of an idea of uh, sort of the mini heart attacks you're going to come across. Uh, you're, you're definitely probably not going to be breathing much on these approaches because I'm certainly not. I call them mini heart attacks. You know when you're sitting on your chair and you're, ro and you're rocking backward in it and you almost fall back but you catch yourself? And you have that jump in your chest? Uh, that's what this is kind of like, especially when I, when I landed. I felt like I put it down way too hard. <laughs> One thing I noticed when we, when we first got these strips into the sim uh, <clears throat> in the very early part of the project, one of the first, you know, we were trying to, to stay inside the VC uh, cockpit um, you know, for sort of realism sakes. One of the first things I noticed was after taking off, I, I would instantly get lost uh, and disorientated as to which direction I would need to be going next. Um, I, I can't imagine what it's like when you're actually there. I can't either. In fact, I think I would be too too afraid to uh, be a passenger on one of these flights, to be honest. I mean, I mean, I've always asked myself, if I had the opportunity, would I ever, uh, you know, get on a flight up to Lukla? And you see all these YouTube videos where even the pilots are praying, praying each time before they take off, and uh, it's it's because it's it's the nature of 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 the environment. I mean, and there have been a lot of incidences there, and uh, I think the last one as recently I think was a couple years ago. But I always try to think as as a, as a person who's in love with aviation, my heart says yes, do it, do it. You're gonna love it. My brain says yeah, maybe not, dude. So I find myself torn between ever doing that in real life, and uh, but I imagine it has to be a thrill, uh, equally to probably being a passenger on an F-18 going off a carrier deck. It, 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 that, that must be what it must feel like, uh, both going in and out. So it, it is a dream of mine to, to one day in real life be a passenger on one of those flights, but then I question as to whether or not I have the, and in part my language, the balls to actually do it. Yeah, but we... Uh... <laughs> They lost a, an airline's exact plane that you're flying, uh, same model and airline, uh, lost one of those in 2009, and full respect to everyone um, who lost their lives on that. Uh, I think it was 17 or 18 people. Um, they were, they were, I don't think they were quite clear on the final numbers of people, but um, yeah, it was. they took off from Kokoda, and um, uh, I don't think they made it out. I can't remember the exact details of it, there's a YouTube video news story about it. Oh wow. Well. Yeah. But, um, it's, but Papua had... New Guinea is absolutely notorious for, for um, aviation disasters. Oh wow. Yeah. Well it's, the, the, the weather closes in very quickly. Yeah. And at that, at that, at that altitude, 
um, you quite often find yourself flying in cloud, um, you know. One of, one of the problems with Papua New Guinea is uh, like every afternoon, because it's uh, in the equator, pretty much every afternoon the, the weather comes in and you get storms and rain. Um, so a lot of the flying is done in, in the morning, but then obviously in the morning you've got the wet dew problem on the grass, so it's really slippery. Um, and uh, a lot of the strips uh, have got warnings to not fly it in the, in the morning in a certain direction because of the sun as well. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a notorious place uh, to, to fly, just um, the weather. And, and it, uh, a number of the mountains here are 4,000 metres as well, so the, it, it may not quite look like that in the sim, that it, uh, there's, there's quite a bit of an elevation um, in these mountains, Owen Stanley's. Okay, well, I'm hoping now that I'm approaching from the right direction. Yep, yeah, yeah, that's the right direction. Okay, perfect. Speed looks good. Well, I'm just above stall here. I might need to... Uh, look at, you look a tad high, but... You know what it is? I'm freaked out by the trees. I know that if my wheels hit them, nothing <laughs> will happen, but it's my imagination. If my wheels hit the trees and I feel like they hit them in my mind, then I failed, so... Uh, the simulator won't necessarily crash because of it, but yet I uh, I get really freaked out by those trees down there because I don't know what the what the base uh, elevation is to clear those. Ooh, this is yeah, the go going back to your point on um, whether you'd have the courage to fly, uh, be a passenger on one of these um, trips, um, if if you if you've never flown a plane. If you've even you know flight sim or otherwise, um, you tend to have less fear. Oh, no. You tend to have this um, remarkable belief in the pilot's ability. It's only once you get a little bit of knowledge uh, about what flying's about that you start to doubt the pilot's skill. Hmm. Oh, nice landing. I almost hit the uh, the Millie uh, Airport sign. Look how close I got to it. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I gotta say, I haven't had this much fun in a long time. I, I really appreciate the fact that you guys took the time to do this. I really do. Yep. Complete with tarps on roofs. <laughs> that was Tim's idea. <laughs> I actually thought that you guys did a, a, a great job with that. I mean, I, it looks like it's photo real. I mean, was there any just sort of photography that you found for that, or was it just easy to just make ah. sort of a generic hut and... <clears throat> We made 60, 60 different types of hut. Can you believe it? Um, and Tim was always sending more and more photos. I've got a hard drive full of photos that Tim kept sending me. Look at this one. Look at this one. Look at this one. You know, and um, and the, the the huts evolved gra gradually over over a number of months as we got uh, better at um, roughing them up making them look more rustic and um, authentic, you know. But we limited ourselves to about a library of about 60 huts, I believe. Um, lots of little enclosures. Some of the models I don't think we've even used. Um, you know, we just, we made this huge library of, 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 of um, models and then thought, okay, we should have enough here to, to, to just about replicate any, any village. And um, yeah, um, so yeah, we did. We did put a lot of a lot of effort into trying to make the. If you look down at the the actual um, huts themselves from a top-down view, you'll actually see that the the um, the thatched roofs have got a feathered edge to them, so that they actually look like the rough edges of. Um, of we matched all the like. matched all the building amounts too. So for each village, all the. the you know, the layout of the buildings is all pretty correct. Um, obviously, with the imagery up here, uh, you know, it, it was very hard to come come by. Um, Ken did a wonderful job with uh, taking the um, and painting basically his own textures into it to sort of recreate it. Uh, you know, we used the, the photo reel as more of a guide for where the strips would be um, in the in the sim. Um, obviously, we we're able to get some. Uh, half decent imagery for Kokoda, um, uh, which formed uh, sort of a major part of the project. But uh, again, uh, Papua New Guinea is one of those places where it's really hard to come by 
uh, usable information or usable data. I can imagine. Uh, I'm I'm a bit of a you know an internet troll animal, and um, I've got you know various sort of uh, slightly private methods that I use to uh, scour <laughs> and scan for keywords. Um, and so you know I can run numerous searches at the same time and just harvest data, and then I just have to go through it and delete all the stuff that's not relevant. And then I just sort of feed it to Ken through his Skype box. Um, <laughs> And uh, yeah, so you know, I mean, the, the, probably you know, a good third of this project is actually was actually just research and, and yeah. data collection and, and just trying to work out, um, trying to get as many pictures of the strips because we, you know, we we make use of um, all the pictures that the trekkers take while when they're up there, and um, I mean, most of their pictures are not actually usable. Um, I wish people would take more pictures of the runways. Right. Uh, if anyone's listening that goes there, please take more photos. Of them. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, like with some of these strips, we, we, you know, we don't actually have any ground photos of, say, this place, for instance. Um, so, you know, we just use our own uh, imagination a little bit and the, the top-down view to work out the location and placement. And, um, but for some of the other more uh, well-traveled ones, because this is off the Kokoda track, so Right. It's not as 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 uh, trodden upon. Uh, the main ones that get visited would be uh, Kagi, Lonamu, and, and Afogi, and, and Minari is, is a, a, a well-known spot. That's next stop, by the way. Um, yes, it yeah, is. Everyone, cam everyone camps there, and there's quite a few pictures of the the, the terrain and the, the layout. Um, well, the, can the you do me a favour <clears> for this last this last trip? Yeah, Andre. Sure. Can you refresh your scenery? Sure. Oh, okay. Have you got your? Have you, and make sure you got the um, special effects turned up to normal. I'd okay. love, I'd Let's love the viewers to see that we put a lot of effort into getting smoke effects out of chimneys and old boilers and things, and they haven't seen them yet. <laughs> Let's see special effects. Yeah, sorry for interrupting you, Tim. Distance. Yeah. Actually, let's just turn all the effects up high so that way we see it properly. Uh, and let's refresh the scenery. Just when you say scenery, just refreshing the scenery library. Is that correct? Yeah, just go to World Scenery Library and refresh it. Yeah. Okay. It's a little um, bug it, with me through there at the moment. Yeah, it has very little effect on frames. The the, the effects. It's really, especially in P3D, doesn't doesn't seem to impact at all. 